truth is that mutants are very real, and they are among us. We must know who they are, and above all, we must know what they can do. Mary, I said at the end of the last episode that little six-year-old Matt would be wetting himself with excitement for this one, and um, I'm positively drenched. (laughs) Sodden, actually. (laughs) Wow. Well, we knew you were very excited about this. Yeah. As long as I've known you, X-Men have been uh, right up there among your favourites. Yeah, but it's one of the earliest kind of obsessions with a film I think I've ever had. Especially the second one. Gotta say, I remember the second one vividly because I would have been too young to go and see yeah, the first yeah. one uh, in the cinema. But yeah, how far back do you go with X Men? Like, when did you first see them? Do you know what? I actually can't. I cannot remember. I was thinking about this, and I just I can't think of a time I hadn't seen them. So it must have mm. been must have been fairly early on, like around when they were coming out. Yeah, but I'm, I feel like I'm very hit and miss with them now because. As a series. <laughs> it doesn't work, really, does it? <laughs> it's very up and down, I think, yeah. as a series. It's, it's got a lot it's of highs and way. lows. Yeah. Like, one film's amazing, and the next one's a dud, and then the next one's amazing, and he, so mm. you're really up and down with them. So I have a very hit-and-miss relationship with X-Men. Um, yeah. I haven't watched them for a long time, so this was interesting. Mm-hmm. They are sort of objectively a little bit naff. <laughs> um, but there's ways of looking past it, I think, because yeah. there's there's a lot more to it. There's more sort of under the surface, and yeah. and even at the surface, there's so many like diverse characters, and the storylines are all quite um, yeah. compelling. Actually, I think they're all really good. Mm-hmm. You can not like the films and still like X Men. I think. Yeah. Um, yeah. We're not comic book readers, but no. we we both probably watched the '90s cartoon. Yeah, I did. That was my introduction to X Men. And I, I yeah. really enjoyed that. A lot of memories. I must say, though, just to demonstrate the extent to which I might have been a little bit obsessed. And <laughs> I had like toys. I had a big sort of twelve-inch posable <laughs> Wolverine and a Nightcrawler. Um, I had the X Jet. Our computer had the desktop wallpapers, like these interactive things that were probably really dodgy downloads. Wow. I had posters, the PS2 games. <laughs> I, I even remember we went to Burger King before seeing X Men 2. And <laughs> the toy in there was, was uh, X Men. I had the Nightcrawler from that. I used to pause and draw the scenes from the TV. And we used to play X Men in the playground. That was like our game at school. Wow. That, that, and Harry is, Potter. that is an obsession. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That, I think that's the definition of the term. It's about to get worse the, the, the last thing <laughs> so I was just I started sort of just jotting down every time I recalled something I was like oh yeah I used to have that I actually once collected like all the empty toilet roll tubes wow. and with a felt tip I sort of drew like the characters you know that like, iconic costumes mm-hmm. on there and I remember having them you would open like a cupboard and they'd just be lined up every single one <laughs> all of your toilet but, rolls <laughs> but it's such a good <laughs> yeah it's just well, there's something about them like the, the look of them was always just so aesthetically very pleasing and i think yeah a lot of superhero films to come kind of jumped on that a little bit yeah i find it very odd your relationship with x-men because you're not a marvel fan um really no, well, i think i think the x-men films are still better than the <laughs> than the mcu films not necessarily like there'll be people um, gasping. quality of films but i th- i i think the characters are better in x-men um, I think the actors were of a, a higher stature. Mm. We're going to start off with a, a, a big quiz, aren't we? Yes. 24 questions, mm-hmm. four each from each of the three films. Yeah. Quiz music, go. I'll let you go first. <laughs> nice, easy one to start. Okay. What did Stanley make a cameo appearance as in the first X Men movie? Oh, I remember him in the third. Oh no, I do know, I do know, but I don't remember seeing him when I watched it this time. Is he on the beach? He is on the beach. Is he like barbecuing or something? Oh, I'll give you half a point for that. He is a hot dog vendor. Half a point. <laughs> yep. Hot dogs can be barbecued. Come on. <laughs> right, half a point. I'm going to be strict with you today. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, according to Xavier, approximately how often does evolution leap forwards? Oh, God. 
mean, it's the first line in the film. I mean, <laughs> oh, I know, but I've watched the other two since. <sighs> Is it once a millennia? Is it something to do with a millennia? I will play you your own game and give you <laughs> half a point. Um, he says every few hundred millennia. Oh, so I'll... okay. Well, I, I'm I'm just pleased I got You're millennia. In... Millennia yeah. was in the in the sentence. So that's fine. Yeah. Half a point. This one, I had absolutely no clue. So if you get this, I'll be dead impressed. <laughs> uh, <laughs> what is the name of Magneto's island? Oh, is that ever <laughs> mentioned? Is that, is that a thing? Um, hang on a minute. Okay, so it's in some cliffs, and it's rocky. Um, his island. His island. Oh, you're not thinking of um, um. There's an island called Genosha at some point in the. Oh my the film. god. I am impressed. Well, well Genosha's done. actually a, it's where all the mutants go is kind of like a safe place. But well, if that's... it gives me a point, I don't mind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, your turn. Go on. Okay. In which US state did Rogue live in before she ran away? Ah, oh, I don't know if it's the state. It's from Mississippi. Correct. I don't know if... Is that the state? She, yeah. That is right, yeah. Yeah, okay. She's from Meridian, Mississippi. Oh, I'll take that. I'm just glad about the Genosha question. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I'm very, I'm very impressed. What does Logan mockingly refer to Charles Xavier as when he meets him? <laughs> Wheels. <laughs> That's correct. I love that line. Okay, um, selection this one. Can you name four features of Wolverine's power? Okay, so um, there's regeneration. Uh Accelerated regenerative healing, yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, there is uh, obviously the claws that come out of the adamantium Correct. claws. Um, yeah. W- would you say um, aging? So, like, he doesn't age? Yep, decelerated aging. Yeah. Yep. Um, oh, now I'm stumped. There's one that's kind of like more general, but there's one that's like the film specifically kind of draws your attention to. Um, oh my god. At this stage, I'm calling it half a point. If you get another one, I'll give it the full. Um, no, no, I can't. No, I'm, I'm stuck. Go no. On. Well, the general one is just enhanced strength and stamina. Okay. Right. And the other one is animalistic senses, so he can smell things and hear things. Oh, uh, like right. An okay. Yeah. Okay. Half a point for you. Okay. I wouldn't. <laughs> uh, I wouldn't have got that. <laughs> Which of these mutants doesn't make a cameo in the first movie? Kitty Pride, Jubilee, Colossus, or Psylocke? Um, let me think. I remember Psylocke turning up in the third one. Okay. So, I, mean, I don't know what that means. It's definitely, yeah, definitely Shadowcat. Pretty sure we see Jubilee, one of like 18 versions that <laughs> we see of each of them. Why can't I remember if we see Colossus or not? We don't see Psylocke. Okay. You going to go with that one? Yeah, go on then. <laughs> yeah, no, you're correct. Silo oh, is not in the first movie. Um, again, quite a selection one. Mystique adopts the form of five non-mutants oh, that's in just the film. not fair. Can you name three of them? <laughs> um, if they don't have a character name, just say who they were. Oh, I can't think. She's turned into so many people in so many films. <laughs> oh, right, well, defi- one of them's definitely Senator Kelly. Yes. Um, I can't even remember the first film now. I've, I only just watched <laughs> the third one last night. I can't even remember the first film. If you think more towards the end of the film, there's quite a handful. No, you're gonna have to. You're gonna no. have to give me no point to that one. Okay. Um, who well, she plays? Uh, Senator Kelly. Mm-hmm. Uh, his assistant Henry Guyrich oh, in the helicopter. Oh yeah, who ends up being killed. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh-huh. Uh, she's a boat driver, ferry driver um, a security guard uh, at the end when she gets picked up and she also turns into the Statue of Liberty statue never would have got that sorry <sighs> I don't have a very good memory anyway when you give me selections like that god, it's too difficult right, okay so this for the second movie yes what is the name of Striker's henchman or I should say female henchman um, her real name is Yuriko Oyama and her name is Lady Deathstrike. Well done. <laughs> Very impressed. Yeah. 
Yeah, he only says it like once, I think, in the film. And they never refer to her as Lady Deathstrike. But... They never do, but I'm, I'm impressed, you know. <laughs> uh, okay, what is written on the knife used by Nightcrawler during the attack on the president? Uh, I'll try and get, try and get the, um, the order. It's Mutant Freedom Now. Is that right? Correct. Yeah. Correct. Lovely. Mundo. <laughs> Okay. Um, what does Logan drink in the school while he's talking to Bobby? Right, this is the question I was going to ask you. Oh. Um, <laughs> it's a Dr Pepper. It is a Dr Pepper. <laughs> I did think, I wonder if you'll pick up on that as a question as well. <laughs> that, was, that was the question I considered the hardest and you've used it on me, so that's <laughs> alright then. Um, what book does Magneto read in his plastic prison? Oh, shoot. You see the book and then later on in the film, Xavier starts teaching his pupils about it. I'm sure I know who the author is. J.K. Rowling. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was not J.K. Rowling. Um, t- it's T.H. White. That I know it right. was T.H. White because I remember him saying it at the end. Have you read a book by T.H. White called mm-hmm. it's something about a king? Once and Future King. Is that right? Yeah, I'll give you that. Yeah, the Once and Future King. So one of the King Arthur stories. I might have to read that. I like King Arthur. Yeah, it looks all hmm. right, yeah. Okay. How many children were taken as hostages by Stryker after the raid on the mount- mansion? Six. Well done. How the hell did you know that? Um, <laughs> because I wrote it as a question for you. <laughs> <laughs> but I didn't put it in my questions, so technically I didn't write it as a question for you. <laughs> Um, how did William Stryker's wife die? She put a drill into her temple. Yeah, she took a power drill to her left temple. Hmm. Okay, um, my last question then for this one. Um, Uh what is the name of Bobby's younger brother? Oh, hang on a minute. Hang on, I know I know I it. I thought it was really <laughs> unoriginal to call your two kids these names. I, was, I wasn't really very impressed. I thought, well, if you've got Bobby, you wouldn't really... It's, it's Ronnie. It is, yeah. I believe. It's yeah. terrible. I, I'm thinking Eric. It's like not original <laughs> at all. It would be Robert and Ronald, wouldn't it? Oh, <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> uh, okay, my last one to you then. What does Logan tell... Bobby Drake's family that he is a professor of art at the school. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, such a good script. Okay. okay. Last film. Yes, last film. Who are the doctors going to test the cure on? Uh, yeah, the, the first patient is um, Warren Worthington's son. So his name's Warren Worthington. <laughs> it is. Do you know what his um, thingy name Angel. is? Angel. Yes, well done. Yeah. And then he flies away. And then he flies away. Um, <laughs> what position does Hank McCoy occupy in the president's cabinet? <laughs> Is this like an advisor to mutant relations or something like that? I'll give you... Something like that. Um, I'll give you... I mean, I suppose that's kind of obvious in a way, but um, I'll give you half a point, yeah. He's the Secretary of Mutant Affairs. Oh, right, okay. But that's kind of the same thing, so... <laughs> Half a point. <laughs> okay. Right. How many banks did Multiple Man steal from? Uh, seven. That's correct. I know, because when they said it, I also counted how many versions of him came out of the cell. <laughs> and I think they did seven then. But then he could have robbed so many more. <laughs> uh, what three words are written on Charles Xavier's gravestone? Spoiler. <laughs> oh, God. Like he's described in three ways. That's just too hard. <laughs> um, I mean, at least two of them are very basic descriptions of his job, really. I mean. Yeah. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Um, I can, I'm like, I can see it in my head. It's a little, the little picture with this round bald head on it. Leader is one of them. That's I think. one of them. Teacher. Mm-hmm. Prostitute. Father. <laughs> Not prostitute, no, I don't think yeah, that one was right. Yeah, it's father, teacher, leader. Oh, I did him in the correct. other order, but I mean, that's, that's fine. Out, yeah. That's yeah, fine. That's correct. Hey. Okay. What is the name of the cure mutant? Again, he does have a mutant name as well. Mm-hmm. In the film, he's only referred to as Jimmy, I think. That, I'll give you that, yeah. 
Um, but but his his mutant name is Leech. That's correct. Not a very Pretty nice kind of... mutant name. I, I feel like somebody else might have picked no. that for him. I don't think you'd pick yeah. Leech as your own name. He kind of sucks the power out of people, doesn't he, I suppose? Yeah, not a very nice um, name, really. Love this question. Which chess piece does Magneto move with his powers at the end you... of the film? Son of a... <laughs> oh. Is it the... I'm, I'm terrible with these. Is it the castle? Is it a castle? Is that what you call it? I don't do chess. Like the rook or the castle, yeah. yeah. Is that what it um, is? It's not. Oh, no. damn it. Which one does he it's move not. then? I, I think a lot of people would say king as well. It's not. He moves the queen. Does he? Oh, right. Yeah. Okay. Oh, damn it. Okay. <laughs> sort of similar on the grave theme. What order are the graves in at the school? You see them at the end. It shows you the graves. Mm, yeah. You see Jean Grey, Scott Summers, Charles Xavier. That's correct. Well done. I told you you were going to find all these easy and I was going to look stupid. Mm. The thing is, like, I'm also looking for quiz questions. <laughs> <laughs> right, I don't know how to word this because I'm not a costume designer, but um, <laughs> in the X-Men 3, and they all dress up ready to go out on the jet and go to Alcatraz Island. Mm -hmm. um, like Wolverine has orange lining on his costume. Storm has white. Iceman has like a icy colour. But what colour does Kitty Pride have on hers is it red i don't think i can accept it it's like a proper fuchsia pink color <laughs> oh is it oh right okay really like bright pink i don't remember that at all Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay ready to okay i'll tell you how you did you yes, got you ain't you, got well. you got seven and a half out of twelve did i I, i'll take that i'm, I'm actually fairly fairly That's pleased with right. that yeah um, you got 11 and a half out of 12. <laughs> <laughs> right. I told you you'd come out cool. on top of this one. Yeah, what did I lose a half a point on? I can't remember The now. first one, the hot dog vendor. You said he was barbecuing. Oh. <laughs> and I'm very pleased I gave you a half a point now. <laughs> he was dishing out sausages. <laughs> they were probably getting heated up in there. There could be a barbecue mechanism, like, you know, inside. <laughs> but I'll take that. Okay. Wow. Okay. How did you do at home? Let us know. <laughs> we've had a bit of fun and we'll come back to having a bit of fun at the end when we talk about our um top five characters but let's talk about what the films did for the superhero genre and why was the approach that was taken so sort of revolutionary and why was it considered that way mm -hmm. it's funny really because we've only just done some comic book adaptations yeah. really with, with batman and obviously mm -hmm. they came a bit later after these but I think it's got to be said, what X-Men did must have been a massive influence and, a, you know, really set the stage and the precursor for what a lot mm -hmm. of films were going to do. Yeah, definitely. Um, mm. Obviously, Marvel wasn't making movies for another eight years after this. So the whole trilogy of X-Men was, you know, been and gone by the time mm -hmm. that Marvel even started. But when you look at Marvel now, I picture them very colourful, very bright, um, very light Yes, hmm. there's dark themes in some of them and, you know, there's the bad guys, but they're quite light films, I think. Yeah. I yeah. don't see X-Men as light films. Okay, I um, see what you mean. Yeah, no, they're, they're, they are quite dark. They've, they're very dark and they've got really serious undertones and messages and metaphors hmm. um, that you don't get in the other films, really. You just don't no, see that true. in other comic book movies and that's huge it comes down really to the fact that for the first time they took the idea of superheroes and they really just treated them as citizens mm. of the real world. Yeah. There was nothing apart from their powers, which were given like a rationale, yeah. like a scientific reason. Um, there was nothing else about them. It's a mutation. Yeah, they are yeah. human. Yeah. They live amongst humans. They're perfectly normal, apart from the fact that mm. all of them have these abilities. Yeah, and they kind of make reference to the fact that mutation has been happening forever. We've yeah. mutated. It's that leap forwards in evolution that, that just happens to have happened and it's caused like a rift because all of a sudden these people are different. Yeah. Um, and, you know, history hasn't coped very well with people who are who are different. Yeah. They're, they're very fantastical elements, but they're very mm. grounded yeah. in a reality that we can very easily accept. Mm -hmm. The other thing as well, especially with this trilogy, it was set in the present day. You know, it's not really mm -hmm. set. Um, the, the, the prequels sort of went backwards, but 
Yeah. Uh, they did manage to mix in with real historical events or at least comment on the current affairs that were yeah. happening at the time. In fact, the very first film, as an introduction to what the X-Men films could be, it's a scene at Auschwitz. I mean, it's, <laughs> it set the tone and the intent for what they were going to do. It's an incredible opening. It really oh, is. So an good. Inc- yeah. Because it really does look like real life. Mm-hmm. There's there's nothing um, fantastical or light or nothing like that at mm-hmm. all. It doesn't say, oh, that's a superpower. You know, you yeah, don't think yeah. of it like, you know, these heroes with superpowers. Mm-hmm. It's so grounded. Yeah. And I guess that's kind of where not just these films, but I think all science fiction and fantasy films reflect reality somehow there's always a metaphor because it's always inevitably got to be based on something that we already know Mm -hmm. you know it's written by us so it's it's got to be yeah this whole idea then of well what is it saying and what Mm -hmm. is the big metaphor here because mutant actually you could replace that word in the film with several other different classifications of people well that's the what the opening does doesn't it the opening right Mm. there it's it's showing you this is another another word for it mutants could mm-hmm. be jews yep. you know it's it, that message is right there plain and clear smack bang at yeah. the beginning uh, it's very it's a very powerful tool um it was very well thought out i think starting mm. that way yeah i agree yeah there's always sort of like questions of superiority mm-hmm. between races i think that's that's a big topic power and responsibility is is very much mentioned mm-hmm. as well yeah because anybody who's other is always seen as a threat, aren't they? In some in mm-hmm. some ridiculous mm-hmm. way, they're always seen as a threat to, I don't know, humanity survival or or traditional values, and it's all you know something that needs to be controlled or needs to yeah. be um, exterminated. In that sense, I don't think they've dated at all. No, one of the things I really like is that they use mutant, but it's an umbrella term. Really, it could mm-hmm. apply to absolutely any member of a minority group or, a, you know, a marginalised yeah, group exactly. that, that may experience some kind of oppression or mm-hmm. or be treated differently because of who they are or what they look like. It's yeah. so applicable. It's very much about prejudice. Yeah, yeah, prejudice, discrimination. Any kind of it. So yeah. I, I think that's super clever. And like you say, you could then apply it in theory to any context, in any moment mm-hmm. in history, yeah. um, to any group, and it will always work. Yeah at the core of it that's the thing i love about it because literally yeah. you could do so much with it um so we've touched on just a few of them already mm-hmm. with religion being one of them and we sort of scratch the surface with race as well mm-hmm. well maybe we should start with race i guess it's not the easiest to apply the metaphor to mm-hmm. but at a basic level there are a lot of mutants in the films that have a very obvious physical difference and skin color yeah. is something that plays into it a lot mm-hmm. um there's not i mean that's kind of the point in itself but there's a couple of things that i've looked into and i kind of thought again about there's people like you know nightcrawler he's blue skinned Mm -hmm. um got fangs and a a, a tail and three fingers and three toes Mm -hmm. um the only conceivable way he could ever fit in was as a circus act yeah even though he seems to have been this much loved (laughs) circus act yeah yeah Um, the fact that the only way you could fit in was to be kind of a freak show or yeah, um, yeah. you're like a commodity in a way. Where they knew to expect something different. Yeah. They went there looking for it. For all they know, it might have been a man in a costume. <laughs> yeah. Or something like that. And on a similar route, people like William Stryker in the second film. Mm-hmm. He's using his chemical persuasion drug things to get mutants to do things for him. Yes, um, yeah. And he, he kind of uses them, like he objectifies oh, he them, weaponizes them. And I thought, mm-hmm. why would he do it if he hated them so much? And Xavier says it himself, like for someone who hates mutants, why, you know, you've got such strange company. And it got me thinking about things like um, America's slave trade past and things like that. Yeah. You know, people were different and you owned them. And, yeah. you know, yeah. you used them and they worked for you. It just got me thinking um, along the along the lines of race. I thought that was... Mm-hmm. That was quite interesting, but yeah, yeah, no, the big one. I mean, we we could probably apply it broader now to sexuality in general, but more directly, I think homosexuality is the one that mm-hmm. the films were sort of targeting, and the, the director was gay, and um, yeah. McKellen was gay. He was brought on, I think, mm-hmm. largely in part that he was a big advocate for gay rights. That will have been a big deal for him, I think. I think he'll mm. have seen a lot of those um, metaphors and messages in there i think that will have had a huge impact on him taking the part in the first Mm -hmm. place yeah 
it sounds like Brian Singer approached him and said, you do know it's about gay people. <laughs> and he's like, oh, yes. Um, so, yeah, so I just thought it'd be good because there's so many different ways that you can yeah. look at this just to like run down a few of the examples. Mm-hmm. And the first big one, again, it's one of the first lines in the film. There's a big similarity to the period in your life where a, a mutation would develop is also the same time that you go through puberty or i.e. Yeah. A yeah. time when you would discover that you're different and or, or your orientation or your identity yeah. and things like that. Mm-hmm. Can you think of like, any examples where that is actually physically shown? Obviously, the first scene with Rogue. Yeah. That That is a budding relationship, isn't it? You know, you yeah. hit puberty, you start to think differently about the opposite sex. And, mm. and, um, and it's then that she discovers that she has those powers and maybe Mm -hmm. the fact that obviously when you do go through puberty your hormones are all over the shop yeah yeah they um, do say that don't they heightened emotional and um and that it might be that in which triggered her powers she had these feelings for this this boy this boyfriend Mm -hmm. um and that might be the trigger so it's implied it's her first kiss Mm -hmm. um so in a way it's like it's an awakening in more than one sense of the word Mm -hmm. really you know that that, you know the idea of sexual and the idea of mutation is kind of Mm -hmm. all in one so yeah yeah you're right that that's the big example and they give us that second scene in the film um yeah uh, the other one is in the third one where um the young uh, angel is cutting off his wings. Um, that to me is, it looks just like a teenage boy getting caught in the act doing something that he shouldn't kind of mm. thing, you know? Um, yeah. yeah. Some examples like that. Um, and I guess maybe a bit later and some of the, some of the older characters um, having to come out as well. Yeah. Like was, out my example was, yeah, people. it was going to be Bobby in, in the, the second movie. Um <laughs> they don't know and he's like, I haven't told my parents yet and mm. sitting down with them it's like well we'll still love you, <laughs> you yeah. know, have you ever decided <laughs> not to be I mean, yeah. do you know what I mean it's, uh, it very much feels like a conversation that mm-hmm. could happen yeah it's like verbatim dialogue isn't it that could have been just lifted from any other yeah. coming out scene in, yeah. a, in a film mm-hmm. um, you know there's something I need to tell you I'm one of those people essentially yeah. is what, what's happening um mm-hmm. I guess that what links into that is the idea that mutants are having to also hide a part of who they are, which, although it's commonly done by superheroes anyway, because they always have alter egos, but mm-hmm. um, in this case, this correlates with an aspect of homosexual experience that you would have to be closeted or have to try and pass, you know, to pass yeah. as being normal um, mm-hmm. in society. Um, and it's a massive question in all the films, but especially third one you know when this mm-hmm. cure comes about and you have that choice it's like is it better for me to blend in as normal or should i should i pretend i'm something i'm not or should i the thing i, I really liked it in that was storm um mm. reaction to rogue when she comes in you know she says is it true you know yeah. can they cure us and she's like we don't need curing there's nothing wrong with us you know mm. we don't have a yeah. problem but she knows who she is and she'll stick true mm. to it. Do you know what I mean? And I like that. It's about acceptance, isn't it? Mm. It's like, well, why, you know, we we didn't choose to be this way. Beast kind of joins in then as well, doesn't he? Because um, when they're all debating, because yeah. it is a very sort of debatey film. Like the film even asked the question to you. It's like, well, what would you do? Mm-hmm. Um, and he says, well, is it is it cowardice to save oneself from persecution? Um, yeah. You know, not all of us can blend in so easily. And I guess that comes back to that idea of, hiding again because he's another blue skinned mutant yeah it's not something you can hide and you see that when yeah. he's in the room with jimmy and it's, he sees his hand there's this astonishing mm. look of desire yes i could be normal again is there a line in the film i don't know whether i've just made this up it might be from a different film series um but it applies to this in a way it's like you've there'll come a time where you have to make a choice. Oh, it's it's Harry Potter, between what is easy and what is right. Mm -hmm. Um, It's Dumbledore that says that, but (laughs) whatever. (laughs) Mm. Um, That's kind of the question that's been asked of this. But then you've got some people like um, Mystique, like her natural form, like she couldn't get away with it at all, but she has the ability to be in disguise. Whereas she talks to someone like Nightcrawler, who basically says to her, well, why not stay in disguise all the time? You know, you could look like someone else and get away with it. And her response is because we shouldn't have to. Yeah. Um, it's a very good point. And it, again, it's that question. Do you try and hide or do you deliberately try and go against the establishment? Mm-hmm. The other massive one, and you, you mentioned it already about having to cure people, is the idea that 
mutants are a disease yeah. that needs to be cured and you can't ignore there's blatant references to the AIDS epidemic yeah yeah um, the ways that homosexual people were treated and seen and viewed because of that going on at mm-hmm. the time yeah every plot of each film is in some way related to that a part in the in the first film um where magneto he says obviously it's all set in america and he says this was supposed mm. to be the land of tolerance mm. yeah um and he's at ellis island you know where where immigrants it's famous for it's it's you know bringing through immigrants into the country yeah, um very mu- you very much get the feeling of a mutant as an immigrant yeah that's a very good point um actually that theme of tolerance i mean it's all the way through mm. those who are are tolerable and those who aren't um mm. and the effects that that has no, i'd actually never thought about immigration as being another way of reading mm-hmm. it in especially in magneto's terms yeah um i did a bit of looking into um in the first film, Senator Kelly's trying to pass this law, this this mm. mutant registration act, so that you would have to declare your identity and your powers and, and yeah. things like that. Um, there was a senator in the 1980s who made a statement once advocating that um, there had to be mandatory HIV testing um, oh, if gosh. you were gay. Um, and if you were an AIDS patient, you had to be quarantined and things wow. like that. So I think there's definite references there to... Yeah that kind of not control but it's kind of like cutting off from the rest of society yeah um, we need to know who they are and what they can do and it was a very powerful scene that scene in in the court and you've got Jean gray trying to show the other side defend, of it yeah. because yeah. i mean that whole thing it, that was hitler all over you know I suppose uh, so, yeah. that was how it started mm. do you know what i mean you've got yeah. to register yourself you've got mm. to wear stars you've got to you know what i mean it's that's how it yeah, all started yeah um, yeah. So there's something about watching that, and you think, "Oh my god!" And Magneto does say, doesn't he, a few times, "You know, mm. this has already happened." Yeah, I yeah, know exactly actually. where it's going to go next. Yeah, because he's been there himself. Yeah, and then there's all the different ways that, again, baddies in the films like William Stryker and Warren Worthington, they try and cure it as if it's a disease. Yeah, um, as if you've got a problem exactly that you need getting rid of. Yeah, yeah. when William Stryker sent his son to Xavier's school in the past, thinking that it was going to be some kind of pray away the powers kind of, yeah, like a conversion camp for conversion therapy, I guess. Mm. And then Xavier couldn't help him. You know, he said mutation's not a disease. And then the really obvious one is, I mean, the whole plot of the third one is just the fact that, oh, you know, you can cure, you know, what is alluded to as being the gay gene, Mm -hmm. Um, (laughs) not so subtly, um, because otherwise you're an evolutionary threat. Which is kind of ridiculous. <laughs> I can't, I just can't imagine a world where you had mutants. I would be jealous, frankly. <laughs> like you can yeah. do that. Oh I my be blue. god! I want to do that. You yeah. know, they've got these heightened abilities. I don't mm-hmm. see it as a as a um, a problem. I would see it as a, a gift. Yeah, you course, can do yeah. this. You can do this thing that mm. people can't do, and it can and it can help or hinder yeah. or whatever. But it's a gift. So I find that really hard to to understand the way it's but that's reality isn't it i find the way when you see all these terrible things happening in real life persecution and and things it's so hard to to understand how it can happen because i just Mm. my brain does not work that way i think in a way that's why they foregrounded rogue in this one Um, yeah and i think she's kind of a slight exception because although everyone else can kind of use their powers you know Mm -hmm. at least use them for good or you know do something useful with them um, yeah she's kind of the best metaphor if we're going to look at it as a disease because literally yeah. she kills people um yeah. if she touches them so yeah that's everything i kind of had the, mm-hmm. the one just one extra point that i did pick up that i never picked up before and this is the idea of schools and schooling because senator kelly at the, in the first film talks about well we don't want mutants teaching in our schools and again yeah. another reference so there's a lady say lady she's some bitch called anita bryant <laughs> in the past who had this save our children campaign which was inspired by a baptist minister who oh, said God. he would burn down his church before he let a homosexual teach there and that and that was a real that was a real thing and there's actual posters and placards in x-men of save our children in all the protest scenes outside congress and things like that um so i think that's really interesting then he compares mutant children to being as bad as having guns in schools yeah Um, (laughs) that really stood out that it really really stood out because it's such an extremist view 
Yeah. Um, but it's it would be so catching, I think. It's scaremongering, isn't it? All of these things were just scaremongering politicians. But this is this is humanity. I think our problem is we don't accept anything we don't understand. Yeah, that's directly said, isn't it? It's mankind has always feared it. And that's probably that's one of our biggest flaws, I think. We're not a very as a and I'm talking <laughs> as an average, not everybody. Yeah, but yeah. as a as a race, as a species, we're not um very open minded. No, I don't we don't think. like change. Yeah, we uh, it and that is where the fear and, and the kind of persecution of things comes from because we mm-hmm. we can't accept change. We find it very difficult to understand um and and to accept differences yeah that's true obviously well there are always those who battle against that and fight against Mm. that for the the greater good used Mm -hmm. in the correct sense not the the wrong sense (laughs) Um, it's got some very powerful um Mm. messages in there when mystique starts talking about uh, you know her experience at school as a child and things like yeah. that and you then you think there's a whole nother level and you think oh god even the kids yeah <laughs> it's not just government it's like uh, you know mm-hmm. the average people you know you kids add into, are cruel. Bu- into it yeah bullying and harassment and just general dealing with your identity and being different yeah to everyone else as a child um and then this idea that you would have to go away to this secret safe place school that's special for special people like you um mm. you know because that's the only way that you can you know get away from hostility and things like that which is what Xavier's school is i think um bobby's parents are pretty stupid because how <laughs> on earth could they send him away there and just think it's a prep school well they didn't care really did they well, they preferred the other son anyway, so <laughs> he was probably better off without them. But anyway, of all the more sort of in-depth stuff, I think that's mm-hmm. it. And I think I don't, I don't know, I don't know if people watch the films and think, "Oh, this is about something else." Really, it's quite cleverly mm-hmm. disguised. You can choose to take it, or you can just watch it for Definitely. what it is. But I would like to think that maybe. I don't know if anybody's listening and maybe you haven't looked at it in that way before. It's definitely written yeah. like that. <laughs> and the you comics will. were as well. I don't think if, if they haven't looked at it, I think people should definitely go back and, and watch it because it, it mm. will be amazing to you. It's how a whole many different, times it, yeah. it come, it, you'll see these different messages. Mm-hmm. Apparently, um, Professor X and Magneto were written to be um, basically Martin Luther King and Malcolm X. You know, they wow. both shared the same ultimate aim of view yes. but they just had different approaches one was peaceful and one was a bit more violent i suppose yeah yeah that works you can see mm. that i think yeah it's a product of the 60s the comics are completely embedded in that time oh um, yeah absolutely so it's, it's fantastic um right okay so before we do our top five characters this is where we can just let loose now it's subjective now <laughs> what do you what did you think let's do each film in turn x men okay from 2000 um <sighs> I was very disappointed with this one. Um, oh. More disappointed than I expected. I don't know why, because I always remembered liking <laughs> it. But I just maybe I, I haven't seen it in such a long time, and, and it didn't work as well as I remember it. Mm-hmm. I think it's actually a very simple story, and it made mm-hmm. me think, God, what a throwback to a simpler time. Like there's no convoluted yeah. storylines and timelines and anything like that. It's just it's just good, bad. Here's the situation. They're going to stop it. <laughs> it's definitely dated, I think, the first one. I'm not talking mm. just about the effects. I think the overall kind of look of the film, the technology you see in it, I think it's it's definitely dated, the film. Yes, yeah, I suppose um, so. My, my main thoughts about this one, and don't get me wrong, I like the film. I do like the film. Mm. I just I think I was holding it up to the standards of the second one. Mm. Um, which is vastly superior. <laughs> um, so this one, it kind of feels a bit hollow. The characters mm. didn't feel fleshed out at all. Um, I think that that stops you feeling as much for the characters as you could have done. Mm. I mean, the messages and everything that's there are brilliant. I think the certain parts of it are fantastic. There's lots of set pieces in the X-Men yeah. movies. They're all set yeah. up as like little mini set pieces. But I, I just feel like there was not enough of what there should have been. I mean, the, like a mm. lot of the abilities, you don't re- you don't really get an idea of what mutants can do because it's so grounded. Yeah. You know, it's a superhero movie, but you don't really see much mm. in it. And like, the, really, you don't get to that until the fight at the end. I think in a way, probably that was the way they wanted to do it. Mm-hmm. I don't think it was meant to be a great big showy, flashy this is mm-hmm. it, you know, because mm-hmm. the focus essentially was, no, they are ordinary. 
they they yes. have powers and they'll use them you know in extreme mm-hmm. circumstances like the end of the film but i don't think you know they weren't going around and just fighting crime effectively they were just trying to live they, yeah. they were only fighting crime because magneto was trying to stop them i think that's kind yeah. of kind of it yeah it make it makes sense but there's lots of things that happened in this one that going forwards were a bit more standardized like that you get the opening monologue that kind of became a bit of a trend for a short while you know mm-hmm. this whole mutation yeah um, things like the opening titles they always kind of look or allude to what's going to happen in the film so this one was kind of about mutation itself and it goes down a spinal column and <laughs> i think that's been quite yeah. good because they kept that up, up until today they still do things like that i like that i thought the music was extremely interesting and i remember it being very interesting mm-hmm. there's no real main theme in the film you kind of get like lots of different music bits um, like you get Mystique's music bit, which is like this. The sound, it, parts of it, like the actual action parts of it, sounded mm. a little bit like the TV show music. Yeah, I'm so glad you said this. Yeah, You know, it was very much in there. There's definite references to it because the 90s cartoon was like... That is, that is X-Men for me. That is X-Men. But in X-Men. the film, it, they just modified it slightly. Instead yeah. of going... It goes... And it's the same yeah. little references. But yeah. the music itself, it's like, it's made up of little bits of sound effects, like little digital bleeps mm-hmm. and zips and things like that. And then there's like this techno drum that will go. Ta-da, ta-da. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it sounded like the start of an episode of Casualty or something. <laughs> I thought, well, it does. It does feel like it's quite a dark, dramatic thing. Mm-hmm. It wasn't at the stage of having big brass fanfares and things like that. It wasn't quite there yet. Yeah, it does work really well in this one. What about cast? I think for the most part. I think the films are really well cast. The third mm. one, less so. I think the yeah. third one, they just kind of went out there and were, were like picked out faces people would know. Yeah, um, <laughs> But I think the first ones are very well cast. Um, mm. It's it's the way that they're utilised that's the issue. Yeah, I agree I have with that. no problem with the casting. It's how much they're used or underused mm. that is my issue with, with yeah. them. Well, with me, I kind of have always in a way resented the characters of rogue and wolverine because they kind of became the focus and although i completely understand it because of the approach they were doing you know they're the best embodiments of outcasts and and runaways but not at the expense of every other interesting character yeah Um, yeah and i get it there's only so much time in a film to cover and you know the stories were still covered great but Mm -hmm. you've got your characters like storm and cyclops who yeah they just barely got anything to do and Cyclops, you know, meant to have been the leader. <laughs> you said, didn't you, yesterday, the actual amount of time that Cyclops is on the mm, screen. And it yeah. is absolutely, it's terrible. Eight and a half minutes of screen time in the first one. And then that goes down to seven and a half in the second one. And then the third film, he has three and a half minutes. Oh, it's just criminal. <laughs> it's criminal. Um, Halle Berry's does increase, but she did win an Oscar straight after the first film came out. So yeah. I do think they probably went, oh, we should probably put Oscar winner Halle yeah. Berry yeah. In, in the film. Um, I think it goes without saying that Ian McKellen and Patrick Stewart were genius casting choices. Yeah, they were going to get good screen time. <laughs> yeah, I just oh, I can't see anyone else playing. Oh, no, I know obviously we've seen younger versions, but I can't imagine <laughs> anyone else playing those two characters as well. Yeah, the second one, I feel it made up for so many issues that I had mm. with the first one. Just, I mean, just as a whole, the film is completely better. It's, it's a better script than the first mm-hmm. one. I mean, within the first 20 minutes, you can see this is a much better film in yeah. all aspects. They've also, they also improved like elements from the first one, like Cerebro, for example, when you're actually mm. seeing like that, yeah, there's yeah. a lot of elements that they've improved on. Um, yeah. Not not just um, added just in. Kept as it, yeah. Yeah. They show you right from the beginning much more of the abilities the characters have, mm-hmm. which is what you want from the characters. You want to know what they can do. You want to <laughs> see that. You want, that's, that's what you want from the films. Um, mm. And most importantly, you also get closer to the characters. You're seeing more mm-hmm. of them. You're getting to know them more. They're much more fleshed out. And that was my yeah. biggest problem with the first film. I think in the first one, the stakes are high for the people who are attending the United Nations summit, Yeah, but not really for anybody else. 
Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's nothing directly threatening mutants as such. Yeah, whereas this one, the states are completely upped. It's like extinction, basically. Yeah, and you've got, you know, their mansions being raided at the beginning, the president's mm -hmm. getting attacked at the beginning in one of the that best scenes. That is one of the <laughs> greatest opening <laughs> scenes of a movie. Trust me, after my Burger King in 2003. <laughs> <laughs> And again, like I said before, there's lots of mini set pieces in this where yeah. all the elements come together. Uh, for example, the um, mystique breaking into the office and um, the church where they find Nightcrawler. Mm -hmm. um, there's, yeah. you know, and they're utilizing all the music and, and you know, and the script and just it's really perfectly plotted. Um, mm -hmm. So each of those set pieces work really, really well. I like that the the villains are always human. Now, there's no super villains that come out. I mean, Magneto is an is an exception. Well, see, this is something I want to discuss. Magneto, I think, is one of the most interesting characters. Yeah, they make you pity Magneto because he was used in this awful way against his will, and it mm -hmm. blurs the lines between him being good and evil. What Magneto does, he always goes about things in the violent way and, and too far. But mm. Magneto is not wrong. Okay, yeah. His reasoning is not wrong. He's just going about things the wrong way. Uh, and that it makes him a very interesting character because you can't hate him completely Yeah, because he's not wrong. Mm. Okay. I mean, all the way through, yeah, you do kind of feel like that. And then he just takes it that step too far, doesn't he? Yeah, so after and you're like, Strike oh. has done, he's replicated Cerebro and they're targeting all the mutants. He sort of says mm -hmm. he has an opportunity to just stop it. And just to, yeah. you know, have that level of peace, which is what but Xavier he can't do would that. have done. He can't. He has to say, you know what? Kill the humans while you're at it. But he was in a prison camp as a child, so you kind he, he of can humans, understand yeah. his his reasoning behind that. He knows what humanity can do. For him, it's, it's last resort. And then we said it earlier. He mm. he's seen history repeat itself yeah. over and over and over again, and he truly believes that for as long as mutants are around, humans will never get on with them. So why not just get rid of humans? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Part of me, I'm like. I'm all right then. <laughs> I've got to say, Wolverine, back again, causing trouble. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Why is he so determined to break up couples? I mean, what what's he doing? <laughs> what's the point? The whole Jean Grey thing, I don't, I just don't like. I, I, Find someone else. <laughs> yeah, I just don't, I don't like that, I have to admit. No. But I mostly hate it because it, it shat all over Cyclops, like they literally just pushed him to the side. It really did. But I do like the storyline in this one for Wolverine, yeah. like, you know, the amnesia and the figuring out who he is and, mm. and that, you know, and Strike is a brilliant character. He mm -hmm. really is a brilliant, and Brian Cox is just I mean, he's oh, fabulous, so isn't he? Good, so yeah. he always is. He's very underrated, I think. Yeah, he was really good. And there are parts of this, like, that obviously what he as a character is doing, like mm. the breaking at the school, it's brutal. Because yeah, yeah. when you actually think about it, it's traumatising, knowing that they're yeah. actually attacking children. Yeah, and the fact that he's um, forced Nightcrawler to do the mm. presidential assassination attempt yeah, so that he could get permission to go and do it so that he could steal Cerebro, that he could capture kids and test on yeah. them and it's, kill mutants. It's brutal. It's, it's really dark. Plan. Yeah. And it's all rooted in the fact that he just can't stand that his son was a mutant. Was one of them, yeah. He can't, he, he can't accept it. And he projects that, that loathing onto yeah. every other mutant. Mm -hmm. I think there's tons of scenes, but one that I really liked that stood out was the adamantium fight. Oh, so good. It's breathtaking to watch because you, you, it's a fair fight. Yeah, the stakes are equal, aren't they? Because they can't die. <laughs> yeah, you know all about Wolverine. You know mm. his abilities. Yeah. And this woman has exactly the same. <laughs> um, <laughs> and more claws. Yeah, and they're longer. <laughs> yeah, so it, you're like, how on earth is this mm. going to end? I don't know her from anything else. Her name's Kelly Who. Um, but her and Alan Cumming, I think, were brilliant additions. They're just perfect secondary characters that they brought in. I still think number two is one of the best superhero films ever made. I agree. It's, a, it's just a really so good. entertaining film. Yeah. It's never boring. It's set piece to set piece to set piece. I mean, there's loads we haven't even said. There's a fight in the jet at one point. There's the yeah. cars and the fire and Magneto escapes his plastic prison. Mm -hmm. And then the whole last hour at Alkali Lake, let's not even, <laughs> yeah. not even go there. It's really, really well put together. So, so moving on to the last one then. Yeah. 
my, the first thing I took from this was that it's not as bad as its reputation. No, it definitely isn't. It's got a lot of the same themes, the power mm. and, and responsibility with power, um, choices, whether willing or forced. Um, is mm-hmm. there a need for a cure? Is it necessary? Yeah. Um, so yeah. I don't think it's quite as bad no. as its reputation. And you used the word, I think probably the best word to describe the third one, uh, clunky. It's just a little bit less glued together. And I think it did come with the change of director, although I, I think Brian Singer left to go and do Superman Returns, which mm-hmm. I, I just, I just probably shouldn't you know, have just stuck it out. <laughs> yeah. and, and, just do the last one. So, yeah. yeah, I think the change of director to Brett Ratner instead destabilized it a little bit. Um, I think a lot of the comic book fans, the actual original source material fans, mm. would probably have the most problem with this because they took... Yeah the Dark Phoenix storyline, that it was very sort of rushed. Yeah, yeah. In fact, I've written here, this film should really have been called X-Men 3. Gene! Gene! <laughs> <laughs> you know. I think the first two thirds are fine. They're, you mm. know, they've still got those themes of like fighting hate and intolerance. That's yeah, like absolutely. The, you know, yeah. So the first two thirds, like bringing about the cure and, and that question of, of like different characters and how they feel about it, rogue and mm-hmm. stuff. Um, I think that's all fine. The first two thirds are, are, um, are very well done. Um, apart from the fact that the characters are so underserved. Rogue just yeah. disappears. And- she's out oh. of the bloody movie. She's <laughs> just gone. She doesn't even come back at the end for the fight. And they, obviously she's lost a power so you, mm. you know well no one seemed to even notice i mean my favorite line in the film because it was just so ridiculous was that um iceman run you know goes and knocks on her door because no one's bothered to tell him that she's bloody left the night before no he knocks no. on the door and, he, and he's like oh no she is gone and he comes out <laughs> and he looks at colossus and says peter have you seen rogue and he goes yeah she took off <laughs> That's it. Oh, thank you. Well, I'm I'm her boyfriend, so it's nice of you to have uh, told me. And uh, thank yeah. you very much. I have a problem with the scene where um, Mystique is cured. You know, she saves, yeah. she saves him basically. Yeah. Um, but the way he just kind of shrugs her off, so callous. If, and it, I don't know if a bit that, more, couldn't they? Yeah, yeah, it's that. I have I had a real problem with that. Yeah. When you think that actually how long those two have meant to have known each other and worked together it and just maybe even loved work. each yeah. other. Yeah, that doesn't work uh, for me, a that. Bit. Yeah. Um, a few things that I picked out. I mean, Juggernaut himself is a very unusual character. He's fun, but he's mm-hmm. a very odd addition. And Vinnie Jones, like, he kind of probably did the best he could with... <laughs> what he was but given, again it's like we say they just pick these faces that people would know to put in odd. parts yeah you um, know. but there's things like he would charge through a group of people and the sound effect they chose to use was bowling pins being knocked down do you know i never actually took that on board but i will listen out for that one it just made you think don't do that that turns it back into a cartoon yeah that diminishes what's just been built up over the last two films there was a bit i did like um when logan puts on the suit he like willingly puts on mm. the suit at the end and he declares himself part of the x-men and that's a big moment because um he's always been on the fringes like more of an outsider mm. an unwilling participator to you know what's going on and um, so that bit I-, I i thought was good i think yeah. the problem starts um with the moving of the bridge san francisco bridge I and mean, that itself is fine Apart from the fact that it's instantly night time after they do it. Have you noticed? Oh, that was what I was just about to say. <laughs> the bridge bit, great. It's yeah. just night all of a sudden. Why is it night? It was daytime. You've literally just <laughs> gone from go. one to the next. Yeah. There's no like merge to it. I mm-hmm. hate that in movies. It really annoys me. Yeah. Uh, so that was a problem. I had problems <laughs> with that. Um, but I think the worst parts start then. Right, yeah. It just turns into complete popcorn fest. Yeah, that, yeah. I, I think that's why I say the first two thirds of uh, are fine. There's no, I have, don't really have many issues apart from the underserving of the characters. Yeah, yeah. On the topic of underserved characters, when I first watched this, um, mm. I could not believe the fact that they killed Cyclops and Professor X. Terrible. I mean, not just the fact that they did it in the first place. That, yeah, yeah. that in itself is inexcusable. But mm. the fact that they did it so early. <laughs> I mean, Cyclops is yeah. gone within the first, the first like 10 minutes. 10 minutes. <laughs> it's like, what? Yeah. What are you doing? I mean, it's for me, terrible. As, as uh, well, I guess I would have been then, what, a 13-year-old boy, <laughs> mm-hmm. knowing that I would never see those characters again actually really upset me. 
Mm. Well, James Marsden, I, I, really have a very, I have a soft spot for James yeah. Marsden. He's a very good looking <laughs> okay. man. Um, I was very upset. But, I, yeah. but it's just gone. You don't actually see him die either. You don't see anything of it. Not He's really, gone. No. Yeah. I, if I was him, I'd have been pretty pissed off, to be honest. Yeah. Um, yeah. If this is the script you're handing me, I've, I'm mm-hmm. supposed to have been a main character and you're like... He deserved better. The no thought went into <laughs> that whatsoever. They just yeah. It's like they didn't care. He's just, ah, oh, he's in the way, we don't need him, so it's just, you know. Generally, overall, I think the difference for me in this one is that all of a sudden there's a lot more CGI. Mm-hmm. Um, there's more artificial looking than the other two. Um, it mm-hmm. lost the darkness of the first two and it lost the reality of the first two. Um, yeah. Although I will say the opening scene, slightly different to the ones where they go back 20 years and they had that de-aging technology on Patrick Stewart and me McKellen. I don't think that had really been done. Mm. That might have even been the first time they properly de-aged actors. Yeah. Um, but yeah, a lot of the effects, um, whilst what they were depicting was quite spectacular, I think if you sort of look closely. Yeah. There's just a sense in the back of it, like the Uncanny Valley kind of part of your brain saying, I don't believe it. It's not quite got quite as perfect a finish. Yeah. And I think it's because they were just trying to do so much. Yeah, that can be a real problem for films. I think if you just, sometimes you just need to do less. Yeah, yeah. You just need to bring it down a notch and do do less in it. It's the curse of being the third film in the trilogy. We said it with mm. Dark Knight as well. There's that expectation to go out with a bang. Yeah. So although you say that that last section in the film kind of falls flat, which I'll tell you what, I, I love the last scene, mm. that implication that the cure wasn't permanent. Yeah. And Magneto yeah. moves the piece and they go... And yeah, like, yes! that is a great, <laughs> that's a great ending. It really is. It gives me goosebumps. Oh. That worked really well. It was a great way to end it. X-Men 3 was one of the first films I can think of that standardised having a post credit scene. Um, mm-hmm. in a in a superhero film, yeah, because you you barely get a superhero film without it now. Yeah, that's true. It became like a staple, didn't it? Mm. You kind of you sit and wait for it, don't you? That okay. leads us on to a nice fun little bit now. Um, yeah, top five characters from the first trilogy. Mm. So, map. What's your number five uh, slot? A lot for of people could have gone in this slot. Um, okay. And I feel like maybe there was more deserving people to go in this one. But however, I do genuinely like Cyclops, and I always have. <laughs> um, the films did him dirty, big style. Mm-hmm. Uh, James Marsden deserved loads better, um, and I think he did have a lot more to give, and his character had a lot more to do. But there are yeah. moments, I think, where he really does shine, even if it's just for a couple of seconds. He is a leader. This is the one I've put in because it's one of my favourites and I thought I could, I, I couldn't not put him in my list. Yeah, he's one of my favourites, but I can't include him here because he's just not used properly um, yeah. and it ruins it, I think, what, yeah. what they did. So my number five is Magneto. Right, okay. I like that all of the edges are blurred around Magneto. Is he good? Mm-hmm. Is he bad? Um, obviously, Ian, Mac- Ian McCullen's just amazing. Oh, yeah. um, that's just a given. Um, and mm-hmm. it was always going to be a great part. It's the scenes in it where he's more human, kind of those barriers come down that I like his character mm-hmm. the most. And I, I think that's really well done. Mystique, I really like as well. She just missed out. The actress was underserved, really. Mm, we might talk about her a bit later. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, so that's my, my number five. What's your number four? Number four, Nightcrawler. Okay. Okay, yeah. Um, again, I've mostly put him because Cyclops and Nightcrawler were my favourite. Why wasn't he in the third one? He was such a huge part know, of really. the second one. What happened there? Not sure. I think mostly it's a power thing. Mm-hmm. Um, if teleportation was an option for me, yeah. which it isn't right now, I'd um, love I would that. pick it over <laughs> flying, I think. I think it would yeah. even trump oh, flying. Yeah, yeah um, I'd pick teleportation, I think, would be one of my main ones, yeah. That opening scene of X-Men 2 just solidified, like... That was like iconic, legendary status, that scene. And um, that's gone on to inspire, you know, the Quicksilver scenes in the next mm-hmm, mm-hmm. next films and things like that. Um, yeah, that scene changed my life. I truly mm-hmm. believe seeing that in the cinema absolutely put me on a path. <laughs> to, and that's why I'm here today. <laughs> my number four <laughs> is, um, is Iceman. I have a real okay. soft spot for Bobby. I really like Bobby. Yeah, um, I like right. he's really just a genuinely nice person. Mm-hmm. He has a very good heart. 
and I like his abilities as well. I I don't think you really get to see much of them. Really, you get to see no, like little. You get a it's like at little, the end of what yeah. They can really do. Yeah, it's like little bits, but I always found it quite cool. And I always liked the went against Pyro and your Pyro because I never liked Pyro. I don't mm. like bullies and I don't like bad people. I always oh, like he's horrible characters. in those films. Yeah, so I, I like the fact that he always kind of cools down the situation. He always solves the mm. problem. So yeah, I really I do. I like Bobby. Number three for me is Mystique. She's just just brilliant. There's no limits to what she can do. She's I'll yeah. she's a shape shifting acrobatic killer hacker. <laughs> <laughs> um, and whenever she turns up in a scene, or when you realise that she's in the scene, mm-hmm. um, you just know that something crazy is about to go down. She'll just destroy everybody in the room. She can yeah. get out of handcuffs. She can break people's necks. She'll kick slap the senator in the face and you know, all sorts of stuff. And mm-hmm. she can infiltrate pretty much everywhere. She's smart. She's yeah. not show offy as such. There's, only, there's mm-hmm. only one instance where she sort of flips and she goes out the doors as they close and sticks her middle finger up as yeah. they close. Um, but you mentioned the actress. Now, Rebecca Romain was actually, I think she was just a model. Yeah, I, she looks like a model, I have to say. I think she was probably not necessarily underserved, but I think she wasn't given so much to say mm-hmm. as much to actually do physically with her body. Because I, um, yeah. I have the feeling she's not a proper actress. Sorry, sorry if you're listening, mm. Rebecca. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, um, I think it was more yeah physicality and the allure and the ambiguity she brought. You know, Mystique almost becomes not just a code name, but it becomes her, that's her identity, isn't it? She's a mm-hmm. mystery, and how does she do it? Absolutely mm-hmm. brilliant. Oh yeah, brilliant character. And the effects that they put onto her and the the makeup she obviously went through at the time. Jennifer Lawrence ended up having a costume instead, um, but she was fully naked with the makeup and things like that. I think yeah, she just stands out as that character. <laughs> My number three is Storm. Mm-hmm. I like the fact that she's comfortable in herself um, as a character. Yeah, I like that she doesn't think of herself as having a problem. She's very confident of her powers, um, and her powers are just super cool as well. I love that her eyes go white, and she, you know, because <laughs> I. But I think also, really, I don't think you see the effects of what she could really do, apart from just some electric blasts. I never saw rain. <laughs> yeah, if you think of what she's, she is in control of nature. She did do the tornadoes, I yeah. suppose, at one point, but I feel like yeah. that even could have been a bit more targeted. She really is uh, really powerful. I, I just, I, yeah, I really like her, and the fact that obviously she's a teacher as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think you get the um, the sense of Storm that she's been an underdog maybe for a lot, mm-hmm, a lot mm-hmm. of her life. Yeah, but she gets more of an arc in that. Not only does she get more responsibility she goes on but in the end Xavier's talking to her as if to say I was hoping you might take my place Mm -hmm. actually yeah I really like uh, Halle Berry plays it really well as well go on then what's what's your next one reluctant second one uh wolverine okay, okay. wolverine I, I i say i'm reluctant to do this because like i said i do hold a lot of resentment over the character it's nothing to do with Hugh jackman it's nothing to do with any of that it's purely because the films all became about him every film became mm. about him three more spin-offs became about him he even yeah. somehow turned up in first class days of future past became about him he, and mm-hmm. he dominates these three films as well like it's a lot of films to spend with wolverine but however hugh jackman I think it's great. This role made him yeah. a film star. It it literally is his part, isn't it? You can't, yeah. you can't imagine anybody else in, in that role. He really did yeah. take it on. And the fact he'd, he'd never done film acting before as well. I think he, he grew into the role. I mean, not to yeah. say that he wasn't great in the first one, but even physically, the way he transformed. I think the action scenes are fantastic. I think the stunts are fantastic. Um, I like the way that the whole Weapon X, you know, his history has been handled. It's not going mm-hmm. into it in too much depth, but it's enough to fuel his character. Oh, it just, yeah, it kept you going. Um, it was interesting. Um, mm-hmm. But you still don't know anything about him, really. You just no. know that this happened to him. And that's part of his kind of mystique, so to speak. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It's important that we have characters that don't know who they are, because that's mm-hmm. kind of the point, I suppose. And I just wish it hadn't been at the expense of other characters. Yeah, but never mind. Um. Well, mine is the same. Oh, okay. My second is also Wolverine. I had him at one. Um, but right. I just I had to move him down a bit. Okay. 
I don't like the character necessarily all the mm. time. Like we yeah. were saying, like them coming out and stealing other people's girls and stuff like that. <laughs> nah, I'm not on board with that. Nah. I don't like that. Um, so, so yeah, so he's he's in the t- number two spot for me. Okay. I think I know what your number one's going to be then. Um, my number Do one. You? I think so. I don't know now. <laughs> okay. Um, my number one, I have gone for Magneto. Uh, I'm not surprised by this. I think the performance is solid. I think he absolutely nailed every Mm -hmm. look, every belief, every struggle, every plight, every everything. I think he absolutely understood the character that he brought more to. I think he really brought a gravity um, Mm -hmm. to the role. Mm -hmm. And like I said, I I believe from watching Ian McKellen. Yeah, that he has experienced what Magneto had gone through. Um, yeah, I believe what he said when he when he um, made those speeches yeah, or when he appeared on the those news. Words. Yeah, yeah. So he knows how to create and sustain a character, and I think mm-hmm. from beginning to end of those three films, he yeah. just is he doesn't falter at all. No, I think he's a perfect character, and I think he was the perfect choice. I don't think anyone else could have done what he did. Mm-hmm. <laughs> this really makes me laugh. This it does make me laugh because it just shows us at oppositions again. <laughs> like we're always exactly, on the yeah. completely opposite <laughs> side. Yeah, my first is Professor X. Okay. I just I have a thing about really wise older kind of mentor characters. I always <laughs> just really like them and yeah. Patrick Stewart just he does that so well and but I like the stillness of him, the s- slowness of his words, and yeah. you know that everything he says has a meaning behind it. Mm-hmm. It's very powerful, and that everybody looks up to him. And he's this—he's the person. Like you see, when he's gone, you see like Storm and Logan, and they're like, "Well, what do we do?" Because yeah, he is he the staple. The... He's that person yeah. who you gravitate towards because he'll fix things. Yeah, and I, I like that. Yeah, you get that sense that once he'd gone, the world would be a very different place for them. Yeah, yeah, um, exactly. And that's kind of where you leave the film, isn't it? You're like, oh, I'm not sure where, you know, there's a new where it's gonna horizon, go. you know, there's a new mm. a new dawn and we're not sure what things are going to look like now, but we just got to take the best and, yeah. and go with it. Yeah, he fits very much the Dumbledore, Gandalf kind of role yeah, that exactly. you get in, in that type of film. And, yeah. they're, and they're characters that I just love. I do love mm-hmm. them. There's a few I would have maybe done, but you, I, it's the way that they were used. Cyclops would definitely be in there um, if mm-hmm. they'd have done a better job with him. Because uh, yeah. I do really like Cyclops. He was the leader, apart from Professor X. He was the in, when <laughs> yeah. you went out in the into battle. He was the he was supposed yeah. to be your main guy. And mm-hmm. uh, uh, nah. Okay, well that's it. So we don't have any um, any news this week because nah. there really isn't much of any. Have you got a film to recommend this week? I do, and now we were going to say here we, we've um, we've not had an <laughs> awful lot of chance to watch a lot in, in the last few weeks, uh-huh. but both of us have been very busy. Um, <laughs> but I happened, and this was not meant to um be watched at all but my husband was watching um Shaun of the Dead in oh, bed, right, yeah. um last week and um I happened to come in like literally about two minutes after it started mm. and I just stayed. <laughs> I wasn't good, intending <laughs> to but yeah. it's just um yeah I couldn't leave. I just yeah. ended up sitting and watching the entire thing. It's very well put together. Mm-hmm. It's it is a very very good script. Just for example, the first scene where you first you see him walk to the shop. Yeah, and it's a normal yeah. day, and you see like certain people <laughs> that he passes, and he's rude, and you know, pay no attention to anything. And then mm-hmm. about ten minutes later, you, you see <laughs> the same route and all the the things that have changed. And obviously, as an audience member, you're going, like, "Oh my god!" You know, you mm-hmm. not notice all these things, and. <laughs> He is just oblivious to all of it. Yeah. Um, it's just, it's really, really clever. I, I mm-hmm. really do think it's it's a great film. It's very the, well written. The new brand of British comedy, wasn't it? That they, yeah, you know, they, yeah. With Hot Fuzz as well. Yeah, I like um, I like Hot Fuzz as well. They're both very good films. Yeah. Um, I've, I mean, I picked, <laughs> I did the same really. I picked a film because it's the only other one that I've watched. Um I kind of hated it. <laughs> um, oh, wow. Okay. Well, I didn't hate it. it I, I'll explain. So I watched that film. I told you I watched, and I know how to pronounce it now, the Synecdoche New York film yes. by Charlie Kaufman. 
being John Malkovich and Eternal Sunshine. Yes. Uh, and it had Philip Seymour Hoffman in, so I was like, surely this is going to be good. And it is. It is mm. brilliant. I just don't I have no idea what it was about. I've never yeah, been defeated as much. It's extremely <laughs> difficult to um to fathom. Yeah. It's I really had to have a sleep hard work. Halfway through, I had to go to I just have an hour <laughs> with my eyes closed because I couldn't I couldn't cope with what it was. It's so strange. Honestly, mm-hmm. but it's so well done. Everything sort of feels off from the very beginning, you know. Some, before yeah. you, I, I'd never looked into I didn't know what the film was about. I had absolutely no idea what the plot was. Um, so I literally just turned it on. And you know, just from the second that characters start talking, you're just like, something's just not right. Mm-hmm. And, you know, everything they say is either worded like it shouldn't be or they slightly overlap. I don't quite remember a lot. <laughs> I just remember being really confused really and bizarre. not really liking it because <laughs> oh. <laughs> I just didn't get it. It was so yeah. weird. So the the things like you know characters overlap, like they answer the question before the question's been finished, and mm-hmm. that happens all the way through. And but no one bats an eyelid, and you and it makes you think, have I? Is it me that's not? <laughs> that locations operate bizarrely. Mm-hmm. You know, sets don't work by the normal rules of physics, and um, odd things happen. And um, the main character's continually dying, but he never dies. And um, yeah. his wife paints these impossibly tiny pictures that you can only see in an art gallery if you've got magnifying glass and 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 the whole thing that he's a theater director and he's won this grant and he's going to produce this new great big um art installation this theater Mm -hmm. piece um but it turns into this sort of like russian doll of like because he creates new york within a warehouse and in that warehouse is the warehouse and 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 it just keeps going and it's very charlie kaufman levels yeah it's it's mad levels of the mind very hard to understand as a film yeah and by the end of it, you're like, who's in control? Who's directing who? You know, are we all just performers? You know, what does it all mean? Mm-hmm. And yeah, uh, Samantha Morton and Michelle Williams are in this as well. They're, all, they're yeah. also very good. Um, yeah. So if you want to have, have a challenge. What was the word you used last last week? Oh, mindfuck. <laughs> yes, it's very much one of those. Yeah, it's um, more so than maybe anything I've ever seen. So mm-hmm. That's why I kind of hate it because I was like, I, I'm good at working <laughs> I things out. I know you like, like to this. work things out, yeah. I just couldn't. I can see just how couldn't. it would bother you that one. <laughs> <laughs> but it was very, very well made, mm-hmm. very well acted. Oh yeah, whatever absolutely. it was that we're trying to do. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, and that's, so that's, that's it. The end of X Men. <laughs> it is. Um, so Matt, where can they find us? Well, you can find us at cinechat.co.uk forward slash podcast or on any social media. Uh, just search Cinechat Podcast or you can email us at podcast at cinechat.co.uk. Indeed. Uh, next, we're going a bit lighter, light entertainment. We certainly um, are. It's going to be the 60th birthdays of both Colin Firth and Hugh Grant, the the, the princes of uh, British romantic comedies. They're born mm. one day apart. And we're going to look at Four Weddings and a Funeral, uh, Bridget Jones, Love Actually, and then <laughs> The King's Speech, <laughs> because we can. Yes, because you can um, and you have to, don't you? That's right, that's right. You have to. Yeah. Well, that's next time. Join us then. Let us know how you did on the quiz. Did you beat me? <laughs> Better than yeah. me, I hope. <laughs> Yeah, did you beat Mary? That's, the, yeah, yeah. that's the... I'm the measure stick by which to go. If you beat me, well done. To be fair, hard. though, what was the week where I only got... What was Back to the Future? I only got five out of 15. That should be the... Um, <laughs> that should be the measurement. So, I mean, seven and a half is okay when it's out of 12. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, so. I'm okay with that. I was expecting yeah. less, so I'm okay with that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's all right then. So it's bye for me. <laughs> and bye from me. 